our all age servers. <laughs> this morning we are going to be looking at Paul's letter to Philemon as we and what it can teach us today and and there may even be a special guest appearance from our from a famous writer. As we come to worship, God invites us to come as we are. Let's pray. Lord, as we worship to worship you this morning, we may may we know your presence and all and your love for us all. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, if you'd like to stand, we're going to start with our first song, which is traditionally uh, maybe uh, written for the younger members of our congregation, but it's a great reminder to us all uh, that we are part of God's big family. So uh, when this song was written, uh, the idea was that in the chorus, when we say that's you and you and you and you, you point at people. I know that can be terribly uncomfortable. You might not want to do that. But try and maybe just make eye contact with someone as we sing uh, to remind us that, you know, we're not just a bunch of individuals gathered here this morning. We are part of God's big family. So let's sing together.
do uh, remember being at college, uh, somebody saying to me, the thing I love about our faith and about our faith in Jesus is that wherever you go in the world, you can find family. I think it's amazing, isn't it? Wherever you go in the world, you can find family. Now, a few months ago, uh, we have a, uh, here at the church, we have a missions committee, uh, which is a group of people who meet together to talk about the mission partners and organisations that we support. And when we met uh, last time, we thought it'd be really good if every so often we could have some good news stories from around the world, whether that's from one of the organisations that we support, or whether that's from an individual that we support, but it'd be good to just hear some good news stories of what God is doing around the world, because far often the news tells us the bad news, and we very rarely find the good news, and so we want to be a place of good news. And so we've appointed Zoe as our good news researcher, uh, which is amazing, an amazing job, and she's done a great job. And so every so often, Zoe's going to look into stories from around the world that she can share with us in whatever form she likes. And she's chosen this time to put together a video uh, with a bit of help from Paul as well. And so we're going to watch this good news story now uh, to hopefully encourage us all this morning. to see how Tear Fund is working really hard around the world, offering people opportunities to rebuild their lives following tragedy and disaster. And Fadamata is just one of many stories. And September is a month that we give uh, to Tear Funds, generally through our harvest services, which are happening later in the month, which we'll hear more about later. So we're just kind of giving you the uh, heads up, really, that out through the month of September, we're going to be giving financially to the work of Tear Fund, an important work. And so it's great to hear a good news story of where that money goes when you give it, and the life that can genuinely be changed, and how Fadamata recognised that the generosity of Tear Fund was God in action. Uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful story of hope for, for us this morning. So thank you so much for putting that together, um, and yeah, that's a good bit of good news. Now, we are looking today at the letter of Philemon. Now, it's a very tiny letter in the Bible. If you flick through your Bibles, you'll probably miss it. It comes just before Hebrews, but it's absolutely beautiful. And I thought, you know what, in order for us to hear the letter of Philemon, we could just read it as we normally do, or we could actually hear uh, how it would have worked just to have an insight into uh, life at the time. And so we're delighted to say that the Apostle Paul is actually here 
uh, to write the letter in front of us, to show us how he wrote the letter. So can you welcome the Apostle Paul for the and Let's hear what he has to say. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Apphia, our sister and our keepers, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing that we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. <sighs> Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who also... who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but... I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, perhaps a guest room for me, Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer of your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, send you greetings, and so do Mark, Ar Aristarchus, and Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. So I don't know whether, uh, whether that was a familiar letter to you from Paul, but it's one I absolutely love. It's so beautifully written. And whatever you say about Paul, whatever you think about Paul, uh, sometimes you can read Paul and find his letters maybe a little bit confusing or complicated. Some people have described him as being a bit haughty in some ways, in the way that he kind of seems like he's better than other people. But one thing you cannot argue about Paul is he really knows how to build someone up. 
He really knows how to encourage somebody and bring the best out of them. The way that he describes Philemon is absolutely beautiful. I mean, imagine receiving a letter that describes you as being someone whose faith encourages someone else, that you're somebody who he loves deeply, that he cares for, that you inspire him in the gospel, and he's heard about your faith. It would be so beautiful to receive a letter like that, wouldn't it? I mean, it's just so lovely written. And then how he speaks about Onesimus later, which we'll come to in a bit. But it's such a beautifully written personal letter from one brother in Christ to another. uh, But just displaying incredible love and kindness and generosity towards Philemon. But there's something important in that letter that we're going to learn about for ourselves uh, a little bit later. But before we do that, we're going to stand and we're going to sing together in worship. Great, so if you'd like to stand again, I'm going to teach a song that might be new to some of you. It's called Give Thanks, um, and it's a call and response song, uh, which means that I sing a line, then you sing a line in response, then I sing a line, and you sing another line in response. So I'll just quickly um, teach you the part that you're going to sing. Uh, so I will sing, He sent his son to die, and rise again to save us. And you sing, his never-ending love is steadfast and sure. So let's try that again. He sent his son to die and rise again to save us. His never-ending love is steadfast and sure. Then I sing, he's broken our chains and given us freedom. And you sing. Basically, the song just goes on like that. I'll sing the first line of each verse and the third line, and you sing uh, the responses. And it's, um, I meant to look at which song it's based out of, but there's a, a song that the response every time is, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. 136, apparently. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> so let's sing this together.
thank you that your love endures forever and we can fully rely on you you know all that we carry in our hearts all the things that are going on in our lives and we can come to you just as we are today the invitation there take me as you find me all my fears and failures and so uh, we have this beautiful letter written by Paul to Philemon drawing out the beautifulness and actually what Paul is doing by that encouragement is he is uh, speaking into Philemon's very identity because the name Philemon literally translates as man of kindness and that's what Paul is, is doing here. He's calling out this beautiful man of kindness. But he doesn't do so by ignoring Philemon's flaws. He doesn't in any way suggest that Philemon is perfect and have it all sorted. Paul is quite happy and quite willing to acknowledge and to recognize the difficult past that Philemon has with the other character in the story, Onesimus. It's an unusual name, we don't hear it. Let's all say Onesimus. Onesimus. 
don't know if that's how you actually pronounce it, but that's how I'm doing it anyway. Uh, so anyway, uh, there he is. Paul is writing to Philemon about Onesimus and this difficult past and this difficult history that the two of them have. So Philemon is thought to have been probably a Roman uh, who came to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, had wealth, had a home that was uh, big enough and ample enough to host a church family in, and so he did that. And by being a wealthy homeowner, he had slaves as well. And it's widely thought, widely recognized that Onesimus was one of those slaves who in some way wronged him. In some way, did something to Philemon. Uh, Most people think he probably stole from him or cheated him in some way. That may well very be the reason that Onesimus is in prison, or it may be that he's committed something else a little bit later, uh, or is is maybe just there to just try and meet Paul. We don't really know the circumstances of him being in prison. But somehow, Paul and Onesimus have crossed paths, and Paul is writing to Philemon, asking something very bold, and very big. This is a huge ask of Paul. Because what he's doing is he's saying to Philemon, Onesimus, the, the guy who wronged you, I want you to welcome him back, not only as a slave, or not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. This is a huge, huge ask that Paul is making, which is why he does it as this beautiful request rather than telling him Philemon what to do. Now, it's thought that this is the only letter that Paul writes that uh, doesn't outlay the gospel in some really clear way. And the reason for that is because he's asking, he's writing to Philemon, asking him to model the good news of Jesus, to model what difference Jesus makes to your life. What he's asking for in Philemon is for him to live out his faith authentically. As Rick was saying last week, what he's asking of Philemon is to be the same person in private as he is in front of 60 people. He's asking for authenticity in Philemon. Live out the gospel that Jesus has done for you. Paul himself is doing that as well. Uh, in, in when he says, if, if Onesimus has wronged you in any way, I take the payment on myself. What does that sound like to you? That sounds very much like Jesus to me. If he's wronged you, I will pay his debt. I will repay you on his behalf. And so Paul is basically giving this beautiful example of what it means to live authentically as a follower of Jesus, to be genuine, to worship in spirit and in truth, to be the real you that you were called to be in front of and with your brothers and sisters in Christ. The trouble is that to live authentically requires vulnerability, which is a hard thing, because to be vulnerable requires bravery. A lot of people think that vulnerability is a sign of weakness. It's not. It's a sign of absolute strength, because you have to be really brave to be vulnerable with somebody else. And in order for there to be bravery, there needs to be a community in which you feel safe enough to be brave, a community that's free of judgment, which will come to in a moment. I wonder if I was to ask you to stand up if there was something you're struggling with in your life that people here don't know about, how many of you would, just, would stand? The reality is all of us probably should stand because it's probably true of all of us. That we're all struggling with something that people here don't know about. Struggling in the secret place, maybe shared with one or two individuals. But vulnerability is something really important for us as a church community. And we have seen it modelled beautifully over the past few weeks in what some people have shared and the way in which they've shared it. But the reality about vulnerability, and I found this quote this week which I thought was amazingly powerful. Vulnerability is the first thing we look for in others. And the last thing we want to show them of ourselves. Vulnerability is the first thing we look for in others and the last thing we want to show them of ourselves. And that's because vulnerability isn't a case of hanging all your washing on the line for everybody to see all the time. And bearing your soul to everybody even if they don't ask for it. 
Vulnerability is about sharing your true self with those who've earned the right to see it. Sharing your true self with those who have earned the right to see it. And what my hope and my prayer and my desire for the church, church with a capital C and church here, is that we become a place that strives for that right. That right to see people for who they are because this is a place of love and trust and respect and honour and authenticity and honesty. As that is going to happen, it needs to be a place free of judgment as well. To slightly uh, amend a quote from Billy Graham, uh, where he makes it personal, but I'm going to make it applicable to the church, because I think it's also true. Uh, Billy Graham once said, it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It is God's job to judge. It is the church's job to love. That's our job is to love. And when we love well, we accept others well, as Paul did with Onesimus. You see, what Paul did by spending time with Onesimus, by listening to his story, by hearing from him, by seeing the person behind the slave, Paul was able to build such a relationship with Onesimus that Onesimus clearly trusted Paul enough to share everything with him, to share the difficult experiences of Philemon, to maybe experience it as sharing his grief of what he happened, maybe his remorse if he was showing remorse. And Paul then beautifully disciples Onesimus to the point at which he calls him one of his very own, a beloved, the one I love. He even describes them as being part of him. That's how close their relationship becomes. And that would not have happened without vulnerability, without genuine honesty between the two of them. And no doubt Paul shared some of his heart and some of who he was with Onesimus as well. Paul even did that with people he wrote to. He talked about how hard his struggle with life was at times. Yes, he did seem at certain times to have it all together, but you also see beautiful moments of vulnerability with Paul as well. You also see it in Jesus. Think, for example, the Garden of Gethsemane. Either some disciples witnessed that happening or Jesus told them what happened afterwards. Either way, he was extremely vulnerable with those around him and with his father. And so you have this beautiful scene here where Philemon is expected by Paul or asked by Paul to receive Onesimus back. And it's a big, big ask and requires Philemon to be vulnerable as well. To admit that part of him that didn't act perhaps in the way he could have done when Onesimus wronged him. Because clearly when Onesimus wronged him, he didn't react with forgiveness and grace and mercy and love and acceptance. He sent him away. He sent him away from him. And I think Paul is writing to Philemon asking for something very important and what he asks for in this act of grace, in this act of mercy, in this act of love towards Onesimus, he's using the term partnership. He's wanting to partner with God. He's wanting Philemon to partner with God. The word he uses is the Greek word koinonia. And the best description of that is recognizing that all of Jesus' followers, every single one of us, is an equal partner who share in the gift of God's grace and love. Every single one of us is an equal partner who shares in God's grace and God's love. Every single one of us. In other words, as I heard um, Bishop Richard, uh, who was the Bishop of Lewis, once say, the cross is a level playing field where all come and all receive God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And we are together 
one. That's why uh, with our vision this year, we're not just saying, oh, here's the vision of the church, let's all jump in. We're asking individuals, what do you carry? What matters to you? What's important to you? What do you care about most? Because we think that every voice needs to be heard in this church for us to move forward together. We don't want a vision where we say, oh, well, if you don't sign up to this vision or you don't measure up, you're not welcome here. We want this to be a place where all know they can come as they truly are and know that they will be loved here well. Because everyone here is honoured and valued and accepted and welcomed as they are. Not as they could be, not as they should be, but as they are. Every single one of us, because that's what Jesus has done for us. I've always felt and long believed that the one place on this earth we should be able to come and be our true selves is church. If there's one place we should be able to be the true version of ourselves with no masks, no falsity, no falsehood, it should be here, shouldn't it? A place that should be free of judgment from other people for how we live our lives, the wrongs we've done, the mistakes we've made. If there's one place we should be able to come as we truly are, masks off, it should be here. I want to put it in uh, wiser words that Lynn's uh, once wrote. She said this, I want to be part of a church that welcomes people however they walk through the door, whatever they carry with them. I want people to feel that they can forget the mask of okayness and crawl through the door on their knees if needs be, saying, I made it. That's genuine community. Where you can come as you really are. That doesn't mean, as I said, bearing your soul to everybody here. But it means that when you're asked how you are, the response doesn't have to be, I'm fine, thanks. Now, sometimes that response is appropriate because either it's not right to share in that moment or we feel we can't share with that person at that time. But often the reason we give that response is because we think the person asking us doesn't want the actual answer. But I want this to be a place, the church of the capital C, to be a place where we strive to earn that right to see people for who they really are. With their flaws and failings as we sung about. Because that's what Jesus has done for us. Jesus knows everything about you. Your past, your failings, your failures, your hopes, your dreams, your visions the things you carry, the things that matter to you, the things that don't matter to you, the ways in which you wish could be a better version of yourself. He sees it all and loves you still. And as he said, this is how the world will know that you're my disciples, by how you love one another. And if we're going to do that, we need to love one another authentically, free of judgment and shame of any kind. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It is God's job to judge. It is our job to love and to love well. That's the call of Jesus. So that this can be a place where people can genuinely come as their authentic selves and worship in spirit and in truth without fear of judgment from their brothers and sisters around them. I don't in any way hear any judgment in Paul's words towards Philemon. He lays it out as it really is. He tells the truth. But I don't read judgment in there. I read an invitation to live authentically out, live the gospel authentically, the way that Jesus has called us to live it. And when you do that, when you accept Onesimus back as a brother and a friend, just think what that would say to the world. Because I guarantee no normal slave owner would do that. But a person whose life has been transformed by Jesus would. Because transformed people transform the people around them. And the way we show that our lives have been transformed is in how we love one another. Authentically, genuinely, vulnerably, honestly, openly, So that this can become a place where masks are left at the door. And we know we're welcomed as we are by one another, but primarily by our Father. 
That's our desire. That's the authentic new humanity that Jesus came to bring in us. And so I, with Linz, want to be part of a church that welcomes people however they walk through the door. Whatever they carry with them, I want people to feel that they can forget the mask of okayness and crawl through the door on their knees saying, I made it. And in order to do that, I want to be a Philemon, a man of kindness. May we all seek that for ourselves today. Amen. Let's sing. Stand again and sing.
do take a seat. Um, it's hard. It's hard after sermons um, like that to not to not say if you've been affected by anything you've heard this morning in any way. But if if there has been a sense of of challenge for you, maybe either in the area of wanting to be more authentically you when you come to church, or maybe you know that you're somebody who has passed judgment of others and it's something that you're struggling with, or maybe there's something you just want to share and pray with, then do find somebody to do that with this morning. I hope at least there's one person here you can grab and be your true self with and pray with. Um, I'm sure there'd be people who'd be delighted to pray uh, for you and with you. Uh, Just a couple of things by way of notice, or a few things by way of notice uh, as we finish this morning. Um, This coming Tuesday is our uh, monthly prayer gathering. So every uh, first Tuesday of the month, we gather to pray in different places uh, around the parishes. And um, we are meeting uh, on Tuesday night here at St. Mary Slapham 745 uh, to pray for the community, the wider community, um, and uh, particularly schools at the start of term as well. So uh, if you want to join us to pray uh, on Tuesday, please do that. Uh, So that's Tuesday 745. Uh, Next Saturday is Ride and Stride, an annual event at which uh, people from across the diocese uh, go for a bike ride in the places of their choosing and get off occasionally to go and visit various churches around the diocese. Uh, Money that's raised goes uh, split in half between uh, the Sussex Historic Churches Trust and our church here at St. Mary's and St. Mark's. Um, Graham and I are doing it this coming Saturday um, afternoon, so if you'd like to sponsor us, uh, there are sponsor forms at the back. Please do uh, fill that in um, and sponsor that event. And as we said, the money is is benefited by those two uh, organisations, so please do support that if you can. I mentioned that we are having a harvest weekend on the last weekend of September, so the 24th and 25th of September. On Saturday the 24th, we're planning to have a harvest supper. More details about that will come out in the next week or so, uh, so keep an eye out for that. But it'll be 6 o'clock on Saturday the 24th. Uh, Venue is to be absolutely confirmed, but we're hoping it'll be in the parish hall in Hancross. Um, But more details will come. And then on the Sunday, we'll have a united service here at 10.30 with the United Benefice Choir. And then in the afternoon, we'll have our annual pet service in Staplefield as well. So lots of things to look forward to over the course of that weekend. Um, I think that's all the notices I have. Uh, Let's pray God's blessing, shall we? Jesus, we thank you that you welcome us as we are. We thank you that we can be our true selves with you. Father, help us to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and all I say. And may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, Keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and in the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us, with those we love, with those we could love better today and always. Amen. Uh, two notices I did forget. One is Tuesday mornings at St. Mark's do start back this coming Tuesday. So if you want to join us at St. Mark's any time from 8.45 for tea and coffee and then the service at 9 for the children at the school. But all are welcome to that. And do stay for tea and coffee after the service here if you're able to as well. But for now, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.